Hi guys, it's me, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. Welcome to a really exciting launch. We're going to be watching live as SpaceX uh, has a really cool mission. They're doing a first today, uh, which is they are going to be trying to actually catch both fairing halves at the same time and land a booster that has already flown twice. This is a this is a big one. This is a big one. Hopefully audio is good now. There we go. <laughs> Don't worry, I got you guys. All right, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to do something that I do every time, which is we go to this little website, and it's called everydayastronaut.com. Uh, we click on the pre-launch previews button, and um, there we will see an upcoming mission. This is uh, the top one of the list. This is a Falcon 9 Block 5 variant. Okay, so this is the pre-launch preview rundown um, for today's launch, which is JCSAT 18 slash Pacific, K okay, Pacific one. I like that. I don't know. Okay, so anyway, uh, this is scheduled to take off here in. Well, you can tell by the countdown timer in 28 minutes and 45 seconds. So uh, yeah, fingers crossed. Everything's looking good so far, as far as I can tell. Uh, the name of this mission is JCSAT 18. It's Pacific one. It's a communication satellite that will provide mobile broadband broadband services in the Asia Pacific region. The launch provider. This is a SpaceX launch. So obviously, you know the people hired SpaceX to put their satellite in space. That's how this works. Um, the customer, the customer, Sky Perfect, JCSAT Corp, and Pacific Broadband Satellites. They're the ones that called up SpaceX and said, hey, put this thing in geostationary orbit for us. And so that's how this business and this entire industry works. The rocket is a Falcon 9 Block 5. So that's the newest and final version of the Falcon 9 rocket. Um, this particular serial number here that you see after the B5 is 10 or 1056.3. So that means um, that is actually, I'm going to zoom in a little bit so you guys can see it a little better because that text is tiny. Um, 1056.3, so this is the uh, third flight of this particular booster. That's what the dot three means. Um, this is taking off from Slick 40 or Space Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. And I say this every time. Remember, if you see SLC, that denotes that it's the Space Launch Complex. And those always are, that means it's in Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. As opposed to if you see just LC, like LC-39, um, that means launch complex, which denotes that it's taking off from Kennedy Space Center. So slightly, same strip of land, slightly different location. Payload mass, this is a big old porker at 6,800 kilograms, which is just shy of 15,000 pounds. She's a big bird. Uh, it's going out to geostationary orbit too, so that's um, a pretty high energy mission compared to low Earth orbit or, or medium Earth orbit. Geostationary is is out there. She's going to be cooking. This is going to be a spicy and quite fun mission. Um, yeah, the timer says CRS nineteen. Why? No, I even updated that and I did all of it. I promise. Okay, let me try. <laughs> I spent so much time trying to fix my. Um, let's see if I can just update it. Let's, let's see what happens if I do this now. Pew. <laughs> okay. I didn't have the right thing clicked. Fixed it. Sorry, guys. You guys are the best, and I'm just a jabroni who is very excited to have a video done, which we'll talk about that in a second. <laughs> God, that was too long of one and not enough sleep. Okay, so... Geostationary orbit, they are attempting to recover the first stage, as they tend to do more often than not. Um, the first stage will be landing on the space uh, on SpaceX autonomous sp <laughs> autonomous spaceport drone ship ASDS, which is named, of course, I still love you. It's located 651 kilometers downrange. So that's just a, a little over a thousand miles downrange. Um, there's the coordinates on there if you are super nerdy and you want to like zoom in on a map and see some water. Uh, will they be attempting? This is the exciting part here, people. Will they be attempting to recover the fairing? Yes. Not only fairing half, but both halves. So they actually have Go Mischief and Go Miss Tree, which are the two fairing recovery boats out there at the same time. So far, um, only Go Miss Tree has recovered fairing halves, if I believe, if I remember right. Is that right? Is that the one that's successfully recovered? And, and Go Mischief was the one that didn't, it tried a bunch and never recovered one. And then Go Mystery goes on their first mission and nails it. Um, or it was vice versa. But yeah, it's going to be really exciting. I'm super stoked for that. 
Overall, this is the 77th flight of a Falcon 9 rocket, the 13th mission for SpaceX in 2019, 47th landing of a booster, uh, first time they will attempt to catch both fairing halves. So uh, this is the, um, yeah, technically it's not the first for Go Mischief, I don't think. it's um, It might be the first catch for Go Mischief. So, yeah, yeah. And here, of course, we have the graphics by Jeff Barrett. And um, kind of give you the the extra rundown here. Yeah. <laughs> Don't forget, this is a big, these are big rockets. Falcon 9s, although they're skinny, they're really big. I mean, <laughs> that's 20 plus stories tall. Just the booster landing on the deck of the drone ship is like 15 story tall building. It's just hard to imagine that. You know, look outside. If, go to your biggest city if you're in a rural place like I am. And just go take a look at a 15 story tall building and imagine that falling from the sky and landing on a floating football field in the ocean. But yeah, here's the write up. And this write up was done by Trevor. Thank you, Trevor, for contributing. Um, but yeah, we have some exciting stuff. I should probably mention this real quick. Uh, I'm really excited. And the reason I am slap happy is because I haven't hardly slept. I never sleep before I release a video, but I finally released a very important video, which is uh, why space or why Starship won't have an abort system, but should it? And this is a really, this is the question that I got all the time. Uh, you guys were asking me this a lot for a, literally like over a year. <laughs> was why don't they have an abort system, you know, like this on Starship? So I did a really in-depth rundown, one of my deep, deep, deep dives. Um, so check out, they have an article version of this. And um, we go into everything, including even like the uh, like airliner safety records, uh, orbital rocket success rates, orbital crude success, blah, 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 blah. We go through a lot of stuff. And it's just my intention to really, really nail that stuff down for you guys so that hopefully you have a good understanding um, of kind of the considerations around Starship's design, how you cannot, it's not really fair to compare it to an airliner because, spoiler alert, airliners are, <laughs> can, can they can glide and they can, you can make, Almost anything fly. Uh, rockets are a little more fickle beasts, a little more dangerous by a couple orders of magnitude. So it's not fair to compare it to an, an airliner and say, well, 747s don't have an ejection seat. Um, but it's also not fair to compare it to the space shuttle either because it's made some significant design changes versus the space shuttle. So it's a really interesting video. It is about 50 minutes long. So get some popcorn. Get, get um, you know, just get everything <laughs> ready to sit and waste not waste, learn for 50 minutes. Yeah, it's not wasteful, it's learning. And it really is. That's the thing that I really like about those long form videos is that we can actually get in really deep to some of the things, go through all of the history, because I like that, I like that context. I like having videos where you get to tell the story of how safety was considered in the past, how it's considered now, why we thought at one point the space shuttle was gonna be fine, why it ended up not being fine going through all the different aborts that have ever occurred, basically ever with human space flight, um, and talking about times when an abort system would have helped, would have hurt, et cetera, et cetera, and really just get into it instead of, uh, yeah, I just, I prefer that over just kind of the willy-nilly um, scratching. I could have answered that question in three minutes, but it wouldn't have taught you really anything. It would have just been my opinion. So I'd rather take you through those journeys. I really like those journeys and, um, Stay tuned because this, let's see, uh, I think this week I'm going to have a special interview coming out. Uh, I'll tell you guys, I, I had a really fun interview with Peter Beck from Rocket Lab last week, flew out to Virginia to have some time with him, and it was a really fun interview. I love him. If you're not familiar with what Rocket Lab's doing, they're the only other orbital rocket company that's working on um, reusing their first stage at, or recovering and reusing their first stage um, very actively. Uh, that's flying, I guess, right now. Um, I don't think there's any other orbital people. I mean, there's people planning like Blue Origin. There's some Chinese ideas flown around. Um, but there, as far as flying orbital rockets and trying to recover and reuse them, uh, I believe that um, Rocket Lab's the next the next one really doing that. So um, really fun conversation. Really fun. I, I just love Peter Beck. He's so great. So I'll be having that come out this week too. I'm also still working on the pollution video. Almost done scripting that. Um, I had to hire some help for research. Lisa, thank you for your help. And uh, that video should hopefully be done pretty soon. Um, I'm going to try to get it out before the end of the year. So yeah. So there we go. There's your, there's your, we can wait for the, the video or the, the stream to start now for SpaceX. It'll probably be starting any second. Meanwhile, let me answer some of your guys' questions. Holy moly. 
First off, Per, thank you for the membership. Marcus, you're welcome for the stream. Alex, thank you for loving my videos. Mike is sweet, thank you. Miles Miller, hey Tim, I watched your video on the Starship Abort system. I love your videos and I'm loving the longer, more in depth format. Good. <laughs> uh, catch up, uh, keep up with the great work, my guy, a fellow Iowan. Thank you so much. Um, let's see, there we go. Okay, I've got SpaceX's live stream pulled up. We're going to go like these and put them up in the corner. Okay, thank you, Miles. Um, Dalek, uh, I taught me, I taught you so much about space flight. Well, thank you for watching and hanging out and learning. That's I, I'm still learning constantly, literally every single day. I'm still learning something, and that's kind of the fun in life. And <laughs> SpaceX radio has started and blasted my ears off. Okay, hopefully that's okay. I'm just gonna kind of keep it in the mix there a little bit. All right, what's up from Sioux City? Hello, fellow Iowan. How you doing, Kenneth? Thank you. Brian, new membership. The P the Pichu Squad, new membership. Thank you. Uh, Valdemir from Denmark. Hi, thank you. Um, I, I want to make a request. I really want to answer you guys' questions, and I would like for this to not just be me reading every single Super Chat. So if it's okay, and maybe this is a popular vote thing, uh, I would love if you were asking questions so that we can all use our time together so people aren't just watching a stream of me saying thank you to a bunch of people. I do think it's important to thank you for your generosity. That is beyond expected. Trust me, like, still blown away by your, by your generosity. But I would love to just keep answering questions. So if you got a, a question that's considered a very, 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 very good thing if you're doing a super chat, um, I love answering questions. So just, just putting that out there. Thank you, guys. Um, I have the most incredible audience in the world. I seriously do. Okay, Damon, uh, gonna be in Orlando during the next SpaceX Starlink launch. Is it worth it to drive out to the Cape at almost midnight to see this launch, your first one? Damon, if you are in the area, absolutely. Um, if you're in Orlando, it's only an hour drive. Absolutely. Um, a night launch is super fun. Night launches are actually really pretty and very, very worth it. Um, Starlink, you obviously won't be able to see a booster recovery, but still seeing a Falcon 9 launch is incredible. I would definitely recommend it. Um, I don't know if there's actually, a, is there a scheduled date for Starlink, an actual on the table scheduled Starlink mission? Um, I'm checking. I could go to pre-launch previews. Um, I, I think it's just a net, a no earlier than date currently. I don't know if that's actually in the... Oh, it's on Twitter. Oh, wait. Mm. Wait, what's on Twitter? Hmm. Hmm. Ooh, that's a good question. Sure, I can't wait to get to that. But I would highly, highly recommend trying to see that launch if you can. Uh, Michael, I hope to see you if you are in Florida for Starliner launch. Unfortunately, Michael, I will not be attending Starliner. I had just way too many things popping up. I even signed up for it and planned to come down. But with that being so close to the holidays and with the travel schedule that I've had the past... <laughs> year <laughs> uh, I had to cut my ties and honestly seems like you guys all like it when I'm actually just sitting here instead of attending launches in person um, I definitely for my my sake I have there's three launches that I have to see next year I gotta see the in-flight abort because any chance to watch a, a booster explode I have to see that um, and film it in slow-mo I think that's gonna be super um, epic and definitely worth going to um, I also definitely want to see the first crewed flights of Starliner and of Crew Dragon, but unfortunately I will not be at Starliner OFT1 demo. It just did not work out logistically. And I really did try, I promise, but it's just a crazy time of the year to try to fit that in right now. Um, but thank you very much. I Hopefully I can catch you down there soon if you live in the area. Okay, so where were we? Jeez, guys, thank you. Um, Okay, Night Fox, Starship Abort video is awesome. I've already watched it three or four times. <laughs> thank you, Night Fox. That's amazing. Andrew, thank you. Andrew, Joe, Matthew, thank you. Um, hydration is key. You're right. That's why tonight I'm going to be rocking a SpaceX water bottle. Um, thank you, Claudio. Jeremy, loving the live streams. Get, get, got in trouble for watching them at work, buddy. You don't care. Jeremy's hardcore. I understand. If I didn't work from home, I would be sneaking live streams uh, of rocket launches no matter what. I've, let me think, I've done some crazy things. Back in the day, I think it was when, I believe it was CRS-5 or 6, CRS-6. I remember driving out into the middle of nowhere. Um, no, it was in December, oh, no, it was in, 
Okay, I don't remember which mission. Anyway, I was staying with my family in a very, very remote area of uh, South Dakota, which I think is most of South Dakota, and there was no cell phone service. I had to drive 15 miles in the middle of the night to get to the closest place to get good enough like signal to actually watch a live stream. And um, I was able to watch a SpaceX live stream. And that's how hardcore it was even before I started doing anything on <laughs> YouTube, really. So um, I understand. Um, Adam, hey, Tim, can I can you say hi to your daughter, Lexi? Hi, Lexi. How are you? Um, she wants to let me know that she loves watching your streams as well as listening to your music. Dang, Adam, you must be an awesome dad for letting Lexi learn along with us. So, Lexi, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. And uh, I really appreciate you guys saying hi and hanging out. Hopefully, uh, you guys have had a fantastic 2019. Stay tuned for 2020 because it's going to be a very, very exciting time for space flight. Thanks, Adam and Lexi. <laughs> Bob, uh, loved your Tesla ad, was, was cheesed, it came in, oh, was cheesed, it came in second. How can you be MKBHD though, right? I mean, his content is unbelievable. Um, I just had fun making it, and my friend Neil Johnson, um, it was, it was a good time. Um, yeah, so, so I, uh, thank you. Philip, uh, Starliner isn't the 747, it might be the Comet, <laughs> oh god. <laughs> Um, Ocean Breeze, you know a lot about space, but how do you know so much about, <laughs> but how much do I know about bird law? About, I, I'm probably literally, I might be a bird law expert compared to Charlie Day. Him and I might have to go head to head because I know a lot. Actually, I'm, I'm maybe more of a maritime law expert myself, you know, if you know what I mean. Um, because once you go out at sea four miles out, it's international law, anything goes. I wonder who, who all gets that, that joke. I don't know if it's four miles. It's X number of miles. <laughs> oh, launch timer. Was it, what about launch timer? Launch timer still says CRS-19? What happened? I thought it... Okay, well, it doesn't matter anymore. I tried. Wait, get over it. What, what am I doing? I don't know how to run any of this stuff anymore. I moved everything around in a vague attempt to do something. Uh, uh, I'm done talking. <laughs> What just happened? Oh, I'm tiny. I'm gonna go up there for SpaceX streams. Okay, let's watch this thing. Here we go, guys. I'm gonna be doing a little more listening and really try not to talk over them because I have a lot of people complaining about that. So I'll do some listening. We'll get back. We have plenty of time. I'm here to hang out tonight. It's a clear evening at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida. And on your screen is a live view of Falcon 9 as it prepares for its 7.10 p.m. Eastern Time launch from Space Launch Complex 40 in Florida. My name is Shiva, and I'm a Falcon Integration and Test Engineer here at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California. And welcome to our launch coverage of the JCSAT-18 Pacific One mission. Now today we're launching a single high throughput communication satellite with two payloads aboard, or two sets of communication equipment. One of the payloads is for Sky Perfect JSAT and the other for Pacific. We'll hear a little bit more about that later on in today's coverage. Now at this point, we're just under uh, T minus 12 minutes and counting with all systems currently go. So let's take a closer look at Falcon 9 on the pad. Okay, so we have a look at the pad. Um, I guess we're not going to be talking about it, so let me fill in the gaps here. Remember, the smoke you see isn't Starting smoke. from the base of the rocket and working our way up, we have the first stage, atop that the second stage, and finally at the very top are our payload failings, bearings, which encapsulate the satellite. Now the first stage makes up the bottom two-thirds of the vehicle, and it accelerates the rocket from the launch pad to the edge of the Earth's atmosphere using its nine Merlin engines. Today's first stage is a little bit sooty, and that's because it previously flew two Dragon resupply missions earlier this year, CRS-17 and CRS-18. Today makes its third flight. We'll be attempting to recover this first stage on our drone ship, Of Course I Still Love You, which is currently stationed about 350 nautical miles off the east coast of Florida. Now, above the black composite inner stage sits our second stage, and its job is to carry the satellite into orbit. The second stage will separate from the first stage about two and a half minutes into flight, and then it'll ignite its Merlin vacuum or MVAC engine. For today's mission, MVAC will ignite twice to carry the JCSAT-18 Pacific One satellite to a geosynchronous transfer orbit. The first ignition should happen shortly after stage separation, and the second about 27 and a half minutes into flight. 
Finally, the very top of the rocket is our nose cone structure called the payload fairing. It's 17 feet in diameter, and it protects the satellite from the atmospheric forces, heating, and contamination that occur during liftoff and ascent. Once we're at the edge of space, we'll jettison the fairing halves back to the Earth about three and a half minutes into the flight. Now, we are attempting to recover both the fairing halves today on our recovery vessels, Miss Tree and Miss Chief. Our hope is to catch one of the halves in Miss Tree's net and the other in Miss Chief's. We will not have live coverage of the fairing recovery attempt, but please stay tuned to our social media for updates as we receive them. So with that, let's take a closer look at the rocket and the satellite. Hi, I'm Kate Tice, a Senior Program Reliability Engineer here at SpaceX. We're currently tracking no issues as we count down to our 7.10 p.m. Eastern liftoff time. Falcon 9 rolled out to the pad with the JCSAT-18 Pacific One satellite around 2 a.m. local time and went vertical at 12.30 p.m. In fact, this is the fastest turnaround we've had to date, just 11 days and roughly seven hours since our last launch from Space Launch Complex 40. At T minus one hour, the chief engineer held a technical poll, and at T minus 38 minutes, the launch director held a propellant load launch go, no go poll. Everything was a go, so F9 began prop loading three minutes later at T minus 35 minutes. For our propellants, we use oxidizer and fuel. The oxidizer is super chilled liquid oxygen, also called blocks, and the fuel is rocket grade kerosene, or RP1. Second stage is fully loaded with its fuel, while first stage is on track to complete fuel load about six minutes before launch. Liquid oxygen is loading currently, uh, liquid oxygen is currently underway uh, on both stages. Like I mentioned before, it's super chilled liquid oxygen. Lowering the LOX's temperature increases its density and gives Falcon 9 increased efficiency. We want to keep the locks as cold as possible while Falcon 9 is still on the ground, so we don't complete liquid oxygen loading until the last couple minutes before liftoff. Falcon 9 uses helium to keep the fuel and liquid oxygen tanks pressurized throughout flight while propellant depletes. This also helps the RP-1 and locks flow correctly into the Merlin engines without any air bubbles. Helium load began before the webcast went live, and we'll continue to top it off until 90 seconds before launch. In about 45 seconds, engine chill procedures will begin. We'll be opening the pre-valves between the first stage propellant tanks and the nine Merlin engines to allow a little bit of that cold liquid oxygen to flow into the turbo pumps. This will bring the hardware down to a temperature close to that of the super chilled propellant that will be flowing through at liftoff. We're now at T minus seven minutes and 20 seconds. The vehicle is healthy and we're currently working no issues. The spacecraft team transferred the satellite to internal power at T minus 23 minutes, so they're ready for launch and are just monitoring spacecraft telemetry. The range is go, air and sea space has been cleared, the weather is green, and all systems continue to be go for an on-time liftoff of 7.10 p.m. Eastern. Now, as I mentioned earlier, today we're launching a single satellite with two payloads aboard, one for SkyPerfect JSAT and the other for Pacific. SkyPerfect JSAT is one of the largest providers of multi-channel pay TV broadcast services in Japan, operating the largest satellite communications business in Asia. The satellite we're launching today will provide KU band coverage and improve mobile and broadband services for customers in the Asia Pacific region, inclu including the far eastern part of Russia. What the SkyPerfect JSAT group values the most as a satellite operator... So, uh... Every time a thing like this plays, I'll end up getting copyright strikes <laughs> because of because of the music. So now's a good time for us to answer a few of you guys' questions quick. Um, and first off, did you hear how quickly the pad turnaround was? It was like 11 days. I did not realize that the last launch we just saw. Oops, I need to also... Um, oh, that one's right. Oh, because I didn't change it in all the templates. That's what happened. Noted. Okay, so uh, yeah, really, really, really quick turnaround of the pad because that launch just happened um, very, very recently, um, like 11 days ago, I think they said, which is unbelievable. So yeah, that's that's pretty crazy. Um, but let's keep answering your guys' questions while we have a quick second here. Um, uh, enables, thank you. Dylan, so Tim, if Rocket Lab never plans on building a bigger rocket, how do you think their next generation rocket will differ from Electron? I think they'll just work on making it um, less expensive and making them faster because they can continue to compete if they're able to, you know, crank out enough boosters 
and keep up that launch cadence to really dedicate ride services for small sets. But that's just my total guess. <coughs> oh, excuse me. I'm dead. Um, but yeah, that's that'd be my guess. Here we go. Sky Perfect JSAT Group. Oh. Now, while this is our third launch for Sky Perfect JSAT, it's our first for Pacific. Pacific is a next generation broadband satellite operator which provides high speed, low cost, reliable broadband to rural areas and suburban areas of the Pacific and Southeast Asia. Today's satellite will connect previously unserved or underserved populations in Southeast Asia and the Pacific Islands with affordable high speed broadband. Okay, so another one of these. Um, so let's keep going here. Uh, but yeah, I, I think Rocket Lab kind of is doing a, a very different thing than, uh, than what SpaceX is doing, obviously. Uh, thanks for the membership, Slithery and Sean. Uh, thank you, Henning. I will try. <laughs> Chazzy Mac. Um, finished 48 minute long video. Awesome stuff. Your vid didn't cover parachutes on Starship for boarding. Thoughts? Um, so basically, my thought, first off, it's they're having a really, 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 really hard time putting parachutes and making them work on both Starliner and Dragon, Crew Dragon. So um, imagine trying to now scale up, par parachutes don't actually scale up very well. That's one of the biggest issues. Um, they, they tend to get more and more complicated and they don't scale up linear either. I believe it's something like, you know, more weight, you don't quite, you know, say you double the weight, it's not like you double the size of the parachute. By the time you factor in everything, I think it, it gets bigger. We'd have to ask Kevin from Space Eccentric about this because he's a parachute guy. He likes parachutes. Um, but and now imagine trying to have parachutes on an entire uh, upper stage. It just doesn't scale well. And again, it kind of adds more complexity. All of a sudden, now you're having pyrotechnics that need to eject parachutes. You have all these other options, and you have to program that type of stuff in. So I just don't see that happening either. But... A yeah. big thank you to the teams at Sky Perfect JSAT and Pacific for all of the hard work they've put into making today's launch possible. We're currently at T minus three minutes from liftoff. Falcon 9 is now moving into the final stages of the countdown. The first and second stages are now both fully loaded with a million pounds of kerosene fuel and liquid oxygen. The first stage should finish prop loading. Uh, actually, it just finished prop loading. Uh, and at T minus 60 seconds, you'll hear the call out that Falcon 9 is in startup. This means that the rocket's autonomous internal flight computers have taken over the launch countdown. The JCSAT-18 Pacific satellite continues to be healthy. We're tracking no issues on the rocket. Weather is looking good, and the, grange, and the range is green. If for some reason we don't get to launch tonight, our backup window is tomorrow at the same time. But right now, right now Falcon 9 is go for launch. Let's listen in to the countdown nets. Hmm, this is my favorite part. So again, that steam, uh, that smoke steam, again, is condensation. Um, that's because the skin of the rocket right now, and we're mostly seeing condensation pour out from the liquid oxygen because um, it's very, very cold, like around minus 200 degrees Celsius. Very cold. If you went up and touched it right now, your hand would stick to it. If you licked it, you'd be they pulling one like of those out. from a movie things where your tongue gets 100 and vehicles on it, meters power. long or whatever. And you just, uh, uh, but yeah, so what you're actually seeing is the air, the humidity in the air, coming in contact with that unbelievably cold, um, but not quite liquid um, oxygen pouring out and, and also just coming in contact with the cold skin as well. Just like opening your freezer, um, sometimes you see it come out. And so it's normal to see it venting, that means it's fully pressurized. Um, they are now kind of bleeding all the things. The vehicle is is ready to go for launch. And then now as, as liquid oxygen turns into gaseous oxygen and expands about a thousand times. You have to make sure you're venting it as it warms up, otherwise you would rupture the tanks. So we're still just seeing, this is just normal. Uh, that's, it's just funny to think it looks so much like smoke, but it's not smoke. Everything's totally fine. It's just weird to think that this vehicle is freezing cold on, on, <laughs> on the skin and the engines are going to be unbelievably hot on the other end. So <laughs> yeah, 100 meter long time, you heard me. <laughs> a football field long, normal stuff. Um, but yeah, we'll answer more of your guys' questions. There's going to be a pretty good coast phase in this mission um, where we'll have a lot of time to answer questions. So I'm going to really tune into the launch here today and just kind of watch it and answer you guys' questions when we get back um, after the booster landing. And we'll, we'll stay tuned to Twitter while they're doing that as well to see if we can get updates about the fairings. So um, 
Yeah, we are T minus 20 seconds. Remember, this is in real time. This is happening right now in Florida. Actually, literally probably right now because there's about a 20 second delay. T minus 15 and then seconds. There's about another 20 second delay for it to get to your eyes from my stream. You know, the internet. 10, but, um, nine, crazy thing. Let's do eight, this. Let's watch. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Ignition. Lift off. Your call is pitching down range. Of course, every mission matters, but as we're getting closer and closer to putting people on top of this thing. I, I'm just really on pins and needles watching everyone who's launched, hoping that nothing happens. And uh, there's some Lift off of Falcon 9, carrying the JCSAT 18 one Pacific nominal. 1 satellite to geostationary transfer orbit. Stage 1 is now in full power. Everything looks nominal. We're now, oh, you heard the call out for throttling Falcon down. Falcon 9 is supersonic. We're approaching max Q. This is when the rocket goes through the moment of greatest aerodynamic pressure. Falcon 9 is experiencing maximum aerodynamic pressure. <laughs> I'm do a video about that sometime. Now the next three events that we have coming up will be in rapid succession. Main engine cutoff, stage separation, and second engine start one. Main engine cutoff, or as you'll hear it called out, Miko is where all nine engines of Falcon 9 first MVAC stage shut chill. down. You just heard the call out for MVAC engine chill. Again, that's when we're um, pre-chilling those turbo pumps on the second stage. Now, the Miko will be followed by stage separation or the separation of the first and second stages. Finally, second engine start, where we'll light the Merlin vacuum engine on the second stage and begin, and, and begin to carry the uh, satellite to its targeted orbit. Let's listen in for those. I love watching the exhaust plume get wider and wider. Miko coming up in 20 seconds. Oh, look, I bet it just got illuminated by the sunlight. It's really close. There might be some, some jellyfish photos tonight. It is going away from the sun right now. So, so it won't be very long. Trajectory is looking good. Engine still at full power. Wow, that was a good tracking cam. On the left-hand side of your screen. Miko. Stage so separation. Stage. There we go. So there on your screen as the second engine, excuse me, as the second stage engine begins to glow a bright orange, uh, we have confirmation First there. First and second of stage are on a nominal stage, trajectory. Of the stage separation and second engine start one. So on the left-hand side of your screen uh, that you'll see stage one as it begins its descent to uh, the drone ship, Of Course I Still Love You, you can actually see the lights of Cape Canaveral there in the background. It's really cool. And Three then on the right-hand side of your screen, like I said, is the second stage. Um, you're so we're coming up to fairing deployment. We jettison the fairing to shed any unnecessary weight from the second stage. Fairing separation is confirmed. So as you see there, fairing has separated. Again, we are attempting to catch those uh, on our recovery vessels, uh, but we now have confirmation that uh, second stage is uh, performing nominally, um, and we are looking good so far for today's mission. So they, remember, they are trying to catch both those fairings. So those Acquisition are of signal Bermuda. Falling back down right now. Well, they're still actually probably coasting up for a little bit because of their parabolic arc. But yeah, they're going to be trying to catch those in those boats with nets. This is why this stuff is so exciting. That now, at this point in the mission, awesome. the first stage is currently on a parabolic trajectory from the launch site going towards Of Course I Still Love You, which again is about 350 nautical miles off the Florida coast. To successfully land, the first stage will need to do a few things. 
First, it'll need to reorient so its engines and heat shield enter the Earth's atmosphere first. Then it'll reignite three of its Merlin engines for entry burn to reduce the aerodynamic forces and heating experience as it transitions back into the thicker parts of the Earth's atmosphere. Once it's in the atmosphere, the grid fins will take over, guiding the rocket towards, of course, I still love you. When we're above the drone ship, a little after T plus eight minutes into flight, the center Merlin engine will ignite for landing burn, followed by landing leg deploy, and hopefully a gentle touchdown on, of course, I still love you. I just realized I did my math conversion wrong. It's 600 plus kilometers, and I go into a thousand miles. It's literally backwards from that. I did the mental math wrong. I'm sorry, everyone, please forgive me. From now, and it'll last about 20 seconds. All right. You'll notice a green flash when they light up the engines. That's their T tab. First and second stage continue to follow a nominal trajectory. Let's see. And we're seeing some, some slight plumes on the left. That's the shot from the first stage. We're obviously in the Earth's shadow right now. And on your right side is the second stage MVAC engine continuing its burn. Starting to see plasma build up too and Just pops about of RCS. 20 seconds away from entry burn begin. Okay, here we go. Stage one FTS has saved. Light that engine up, baby. There we Stage go. Stage one entry burn start up. And there's relight of those three Merlin vacuum engines. Now, fun fact, JCSAT-14 was actually the first time SpaceX successfully landed a geosynchronous transfer mission on a drone ship. Since then, we've made 43 successful landings between drone ships and on land. Stage one, entry burn shut down. I'm making this look and easy. We're hoping to make tonight's attempt our 47th successful first stage recovery. Crazy. So if you're just joining us, the first stage just concluded its entry burn. It's on its way back to, of course, I still love you. The second stage is continuing its uh, first engine burn towards a parking orbit. That is normal to lose downlink there on the first That's stage. That's taking the JCSAT-18 Pacific-1 satellite up into orbit around the Earth to prepare for a second burn happening shortly after. Now landing burn on the first stage and secondary engine cutoff number one will happen about the same time. Both of those are scheduled for about T plus eight minutes. Stage one, entry transonic. Here we go. Second stage has entered terminal guidance. At this point in the mission, the grid fins are guiding the first stage towards, of course, I still love you. We'll hopefully get a, a video feed back here for the first stage shortly. So hopefully we get the video from the drone ship here in a second. Stage one, landing burn, start up. Stage two FTS is saved. Come on, baby. Pico one. There we go. There's our video feed. Stage one, landing leg deploy. Yep. Yep. Aaron, cheers. Ready for it's there. <laughs> That's cool. Now, a bunch of things happened there. Secondary engine cut off number one just happened. The spacecraft yeah, is in its parking orbit. And Booster 1056 has just recovered it for the third time. This is our 47th successful landing. Congratulations to the whole team here. Now, with that, the second stage is currently in orbit and will continue coasting for about 20 minutes until the phasing is correct for secondary engine start number two. We're going to pause live coverage for now, but we'll be back at about T plus 27 minutes for MVAC engine relight. Until then, please enjoy this animation of the vehicle's progress, and we'll see you back here shortly. They're making it look so easy. How do they, I mean, just it's crazy to think they've already landed 
well more than half the, the flights have ever done. That's just insane. Because we're not even four years. We're coming up on the four-year anniversary of them landing for the first time. And before that, it was just simply considered impossible. I mean, many industry experts thought it was impossible and thought, okay, yeah, they got lucky on one of the landings and it just won't be a regular thing. And here we are. We're just watching these things like it's nothing. It's just crazy. I, uh, yeah. Um, so nuts. It's too easy. So we've got a little bit of a coast phase here. I don't quite remember what time they said, but I think it's normally, since it's geostationary, I believe it's about almost 30 minutes or so-ish. So uh, time to answer some of your guys' questions. Again, uh, thank you guys for sticking with me. Uh, I, I think we should answer right away. There's one question that I that I for, have forgotten to answer previously, um, and that's what is the thing that pops off when – here, let me go like this so you guys can see it better. Um, I want to answer this question because it's a fun one. Right on stage separation, so we're seeing the first and second stage separate there. You're looking at the vacuum bell nozzle on the right side of the screen. And when it fires up, you'll see this thing peel off from it. Right about here. That is a ring stiffener. So that's actually just cork. And um, they have it um, on the outer ring of the bell nozzle, which is made out of niobium. And it's very thin. It's actually just radiatively cooled and also um, uses regen cooling from the, the actual exhaust, the turbine exhaust, to cool off and create a film nozzle. See, see this big manifold right here? Right there, this big like snaily thing. I don't know if you guys can see my thing. You can't. But the shiny snail thing that curls around it, that's actually where the exhaust from the gas generator uh, is piped into that nozzle. And it, it sticks along the walls, and it keeps the really hot normal combustion chamber exhaust, which is really, really, really hot. And it just puts a little bit of a small, thin boundary layer um, of slightly cooler, um, but cool enough um, exhaust from the actual um, gas generator and it's that so the niobium nozzle is really quite fragile and it has this cork stiffener around the outside of the ring just to give it a little bit of stiffening and dampening while it's uh, ascending and shaking and vibrating and surviving that whole aspect because it's uh, it once it's under pressure it, it kind of gets stiff from the engine right the engine produces and pushes pressure against the walls of the nozzle and once the, the engine turns on poof, that cork ring just gets obliterated as it's intended to and uh, that's what that ring stiffener is. Pretty fun, pretty fun thing. Fun little tidbit. So, um, yeah, oh, I just love that. So we are now waiting for them to do the coast phase. Uh, pretty, pretty fun stuff. I'm tr I'll try to get an exact thing. I, I keep getting people asking me too about the little, little bursts of the, the foil are. Um, I still, it seems like it might be a number of things different. Um, RCS puffs and, and venting of the oxygen stage and a few things like that. So... Um, yeah, before we, before we move on, I'll answer some of you guys' questions here quick. I, I forgot to talk about this earlier and I haven't talked about it publicly yet. And it's quite hilarious to me. Um, we didn't talk about this. <laughs> Did you guys see this? Uh, when Elon Musk was with Edward Norton, the actor in Cybertruck <laughs> wearing a full flow stage combustion cycle shirt. Yep. Yep. And according to Elon... It's one of his favorite t-shirts. Yeah, uh, that made me smile. Thanks for wearing the shirt, Elon. You're awesome. Uh, that genuinely made my day. So um, I guess game over now. I don't know what else to do. Now that Elon Musk is my social media influencer on the internet. Like, oh, I brought that back up. Like, now what do I do, right? <laughs> oh, really ridiculous. Um, okay, I'm going to bring this up real quick and I'm going to, um, get to you guys' questions here in a quick second. I probably should transition to saying, um, if you are trying to get stuff for presents for the holiday season right now, uh, you might be too late on my store, even in the U S uh, our cutoff date was yesterday. If you're not worried about trying to get stuff in time for Christmas or other holidays, uh, here you go. I do have these on sale right now. Uh, probably until we run out of stock. There's only a couple left, the Ode to Delta II. Um, of course, <laughs> notice I did play off the fact that Elon Musk is wearing my shirt and Cybertruck here on the website, <laughs> so that is now up. Um, but yeah, we've got, um, and I also needed to point up, uh, this is everydayastronaut.com slash shop. Uh, I, uh, which shirt is it? Oh, I need to go around and take pictures of all of them, but they do have these little custom tags that I think are super dope. So these are on your shirts now. Um, that's why shirts are way cooler than they used to be. 
Yeah, everydayastronaut.com slash shop. We only have a few more of these, too, by the way. Um, I think we're starting to sell out of some of the, the lunar mission ones. And this is going to be a limited run one, most likely. Uh, we did one run so far. So if you guys want some cool merchandise, help support what I do, everydayastronaut.com slash shop. Oh, and we also finally got full flow stage combustion cycle hoodies in as well. So, uh, yeah. Thank you guys for all your support. That always means a lot to me. My work, uh, the shop is working over time right now to try to get stuff out as quickly as possible. Again, we got kind of got slammed on Black Black Friday and the holidays. So thank you guys for your patience and understanding. Um, it's a very small team that actually runs everything, that does all the printing, all the everything, hand, hand printed, hand sewn, everything. So uh, I really appreciate you guys' patience. They're, they're working <laughs> way too much right now. So, um, all right, let's answer some questions, guys, and we'll get back to that. There we go. Okay, we will do this, which I bet you means that this will pop up because I haven't figured out a good way to do that yet. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, CHRR, how does Falcon stay upright on rough seas home? Well, it didn't used to, and we've had some problems. And even uh, the center core of Falcon Heavy Mission 2 for Arab Set 6A tipped over just earlier this year in April or whenever that was. So it doesn't always, it doesn't always stay upright. Uh, but what they recently employed was a little thing that they call the Octagrabber. And it's this, ro not little, it's actually huge. <laughs> it's like, uh, it's about four meters wide. So just over 12 feet wide, square th robot with tracks. It's like a little tank and it has these little arms that grabs onto the vehicle and just adds weight and lowers the center of mass uh, to be very, very low on the deck. And that helps it from, uh, yeah, from, from falling over. So the only time that they've lost one uh, so far, the only one to ever tip over on the deck was the center second Falcon heavy flight, the center core uh, for that Arab or Arab sat mission. They almost lost one when they had, um, what was that? Was that the other JC sat mission or was, or, or was it a TICOM eight? I don't remember, but one of the other missions where it landed pretty hard and one of the legs got kind of bent and it was t teetering around. They didn't lose it though. They actually were able to secure it to the deck once uh, they got out of rough seas. So um, the answer is most of the time it does stay upright because its center of mass is very low and then because the octagrabber can grab onto it and they can hold onto it and bring it back home no problem. But it, um, oh, and, but, but it should be said that the Falcon Heavy mission, they didn't have the right attachment points because the center core of the Falcon Heavy is different than a normal Falcon 9. So they were unable to actually grab onto it with the Octagrabber. Even though they had the Octagrabber there, uh, it couldn't grab onto it. And that little bit of not quite readiness for the attachment points cost them probably $20 million, unfortunately, or whatever the cost of that center core is. So um, I'm, sure, I'm sure they got those attachments done right after that. Um, Stanley, thanks for the membership. Mudcat, hey, love the long videos. Keep up the good work. How do you think the Raptor engine's reliability will be? Well, um... Here's the thing. I I have to admit I have some skepticism about the Raptor engine being more reliable than the Merlin engine because it is so so much more complicated. It's a very complicated high pressure system, right? Um I have I just have some I'm skeptical of that because it seems like you're adding more parts compared to a Merlin engine. I would have thought the simpler path forward would be to just do a methane Merlin and keep it simple. And, um, well, simple Merlin's still a very advanced rocket engine. Um, but you know, I think one of the big things that we need to remember is that SpaceX doesn't really operate on normal terms. They're not just building, oh, three engines a year and testing them once and hoping everything goes right. They're testing them. They're putting them through the ringer. They're going to have over 30 of them on the first stage of the Raptor uh, of the, of the super heavy booster. I mean, they're going to just be they're going to have so much flight data from that engine. By the time that it flies for the first time, it'll have more data than almost any other legacy engine ever, really. Um, you know, because they'll put all of them through the ringer. And yeah, so they're going to just have so much data on it that I think they'll quickly find what's not working, quickly iterate as they tend to do, and quickly get to very high, uh, you know, reusability and reliability. And I think it's just through sheer numbers and sheer production rates and the fact that they don't settle on a design. They're not a company that says this is good enough. We'll accept this 0 0.001, whatever. Uh, they'll keep going on it and they'll keep going until it gets more reliable. And when it breaks, they'll fix it and then hope that they see, you know, something break that doesn't cause complete failure. That's just very much SpaceX's way of doing things. So um, 
that's that's the way um that's how i think the reliability will end up being so great question mudcat uh we'll have to wait and see they, they just produced their 17th engine um and are shipping that out to mcgregor as we speak that's not a ton yet uh, i mean it is actually 17 is a lot for an engine that hasn't ever flown um <laughs> So they're already producing a lot of those things, and they're blowing up a lot of them, which is good. They're putting them through the ringers. They're they're really really pushing them, stress testing them. So uh, yeah, but the, we're about to see. That's nothing. Just wait. Just wait because once they really start ramping up production, it's gonna be nuts. It's gonna be nuts. No more of that. Okay. Um, Liquid Chris, how you doing, man? Uh, do we know for sure if the canards on Starship are going to fold up for launch? Like I had hypothesized. So far, I think I'm wrong. I think I'm wrong about that because, um, no, we don't know that at all. Um, I was assuming that just by aerodynamic forces that they'd want to tuck them in. But so far, everything we've seen, and even Elon on Twitter had responded to me saying that he didn't think that they would uh, need to tuck up. And the animations show them not tucked up. I still would think, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you tuck them up, get them a little bit more out of the airstream, uh, get that center of remove that variable of the center of pressure, center of lift, being at the very nose of your vehicle. Just not a very good idea, in my opinion, but I am not the one running the fluid dynamics. I'm not the one running <laughs> the guidance and navigation. So they have the data. They will make the best decision necessary. I was just speculating based on just kind of general design philosophy that you don't want your fins in front your fins and, and control surfaces and, and wings and center of lift in front of your center of mass just in general but hopefully uh hopefully it's not even remotely an issue for them but i still wouldn't be surprised thing maybe if they if some of the flights we end up seeing them tuck those canards in so um but no confirmation yet and if anything i'm wrong so there you go <laughs> you heard it here first seth uh, do I think that Blue Origin will be the only competition for SpaceX reusability once they finally get a rocket to space with a paid payload? Um, well, I still think it's going to be a long time, believe it or not, before even expendable vehicles totally get pushed out of the pushed out of the system, just because of how many, I guess, politics would politics and supply chain and relationships with customers. So many of these launch providers actually have. It'll be a long time before that's totally forsaken and totally just pushed aside. So um, reusability, I think, will be the king come by the end of 2020. Like, it'll be really rare to see an expendable launch vehicle, um, especially a new expendable launch vehicle. But um, I, I would not be surprised to see some more reusability, um, an actual direct competition for what SpaceX is doing. The only problem is when SpaceX gets Starship online, <laughs> okay. I don't know who's going to be able to compete if that thing lives up to even half the promises that it's hoping to do, which I, it's a tall order. I'm not saying it's going to be easy and I'm not saying they're got it figured out because they don't have it figured out yet. You know, they're constantly fluidly changing the design of that thing. But when they, if they build a fully reusable vehicle of that magnitude, <laughs> I mean, that's going to be really hard to compete with. Um, but I, I don't know, someone else, some other billionaire will have to step up and, and really compete once that thing's online. And I think Blue Origin... I could see them very quickly getting up to something like New Armstrong that's competitive against Starship even. So, yeah. Um, okay, so let's keep going. Uh, Taylor uh, Gozo, you said in your abort video that SpaceX is possibly still considered using the sweating skin on Starship. Could you explain your source thoughts? Elon, it was just earlier this year, probably midsummer. Um, I think I asked him on Twitter whether or not there's still going to be transpirational cooling. And he said, we're still looking into it. It's still on the table, maybe for some hot spots. So I'm wondering if maybe some of those joints, you know, where the, the fins and flaps or some of those things, if there's areas that would be hard to cool traditionally with traditional heat shields and where, you know, some of the airstream could sneak into some of those cracks where it might be smart to, uh, to employ some of uh, the transpirational cooling, bleed some of that cool fuel out to wick some of the heat away and provide that boundary layer that we talked about. Um, that's... And, and again, the whole, everything about Starship until it, until it starts flying is still on the table. So what's probably going to happen is after the 20 kilometer flight, even though it's only a suborbital flight, they'll still gather data to confirm their, you know, their fluid dynamics and make sure that, oh, it actually is going to get this hot. Then when they go even faster and push it harder, they'll start to see what's failing and all cards. So really everything's still on deck. All cards are still on the table when it comes to actually having to keep it cool. So we will see. And we'll, and 
you know, time will tell whether or not they still need to, you know, employ transpirational cooling or not. But that's a great question. Um, my only source and thoughts was just a, a reply that Elon had once. So, um, oh, Mayor Dell in our Discord has had their wisdom teeth out today. Awesome to have a stream to watch and distract. Hey, and you also have a video out, a very, very long video that I can distract you with. So, thank you. Thanks for tuning in and, and good luck on those, that recovery, puffy cheeks. Okay, um, Jack, blueberry, chocolate, or cranberry lemon muffin? Ooh, probably chocolate. Cranberry lemon? Ugh chocolate chocolate muffins please that's that's my style uh thanks jacks spacing out hey tim have uh have your stream playing at oh you have my stream playing at nasa u.s air force viewing stands go falcon i super cool hey that's quite the honor thank you thank you spacing out that's awesome um turn racing is a hot dog a taco or a sandwich asking for a friend not this again i thought we made it through the hot dog versus taco sandwich Oh, man. I'm going to call it a taco sandwich. Eat that, internet. <laughs> Thanks, Turn. Uh, Steve Childs, I watched your great, or or gate, actually, but great abort system video. Wanted to ask you about, uh, yeah, ask you a question about Columbia. I'll message you if that's okay. Messages are too short. Keep up the great work. Sounds good, Steve. I look forward to your question. Um, I don't know what I would know in particular about Columbia, but um, yeah, thank you. Uh, Shelly Belly, I, w I wonder why doesn't ULA pursue boost recovery? You'd think they'd want to reduce costs. That's kind of the great, the, the ultimate question. Um, ULA thinks that they can lower the cost by streamlining manufacturing and doing a few other techniques to, to really lower their own costs. Um, and also I, I, the part of me thinks this, a part of me thinks ULA's hands are a little bit tied because um, it's a joint venture, don't forget, between Boeing and Lockheed. And it's it's it was almost a forced joint venture. And I don't think either company really, really... Oh, we'll answer that in a second. Pacific one. Thanks for hanging out with us while we coasted through there. In case if you're just joining us, we had an on-time launch of Falcon 9, followed by a successful drone ship landing of Stage 1. Stage 2 was confirmed for a good orbit, so we're now approaching second engine start 2. Engine chill has begun on the Merlin vacuum engine, and in um, in about 30 seconds, we'll see the second relight of MVAC. Okay, that's all it takes to kick it up into geostationary orbit. Just that quick little, quick little, little bit there. Hmm. I like the person that says CGI because yes, that that graphic was CGI. <laughs> Here we go. T Teb. There on your screen we can see MVAC as it has reignited. Uh, a little difficulty maintaining the video stream there. It's a little hard uh, to get video from space, as you might imagine. Uh, but we'll bring that back to you uh, as we can provide it. So we're waiting to hear the confirmation of good orbit. Sorry, I misspoke. We are waiting for a second engine cutoff followed by good orbit. Fun fact, stage two is uh, approaching the coast of Africa right now. So it made quite some distance in the little bit of time that we were coasting. Now we'll listen for a good orbital. And search, look at it. Bell nozzle. And second engine cutoff as we lose the cheesy orange glow of MVAC there. So we're waiting on that confirmation of Normal good orbit. Normal orbit insertion for payload deploy. And we have confirmation of good orbit. So now that that's the case, we will be coasting for the next five minutes or so. So we'll be back just before T plus 33 minutes for satellite deployment. Stay tuned. OK, so we've got a couple more minutes together with SpaceX. And I'll stick around for a while and answer more of your guys' questions. Um, I'm just happy to be done with that video. <laughs> that took way too long. Um, all right, so let's let's switch this up here real quick. Okay, so uh, about the good question about ULA though is, um, in my opinion, it does kind of feel like Lockheed Martin and Boeing don't really want to do any more than what's absolutely necessary uh, to keep ULA in the market and to keep them winning contracts. If they're winning contracts uh, with without having to reinvest uh, a 
an obscene amount of money to be able to, you know, pursue full reusability of a vehicle. They don't, why would they, you know, and they have so many happy customers, uh, mostly government contract customers that are happy uh, to have their reliability and their heritage, which is a value when you have a $2 billion satellite. Um, you know, I, I would definitely consider it's not a huge deal to pay, you know, twice as much to make sure, make sure it gets into space. And of course, other companies are starting to really ramp up their reliability and their track records too. But at the end of the day, track record is really what matters um, for some payloads. So that's what ULA is betting on is that their reliability wins out, that their um, relationships with those customers and those contracts continue to win out because of their reliability um, at the at an additional premium, really. Uh, and that's that's kind of their whole thing. And we'll see how that pay, plays out in the 2020s if they can continue to compete without pursuing reusability. But for now, um, I think they're happy with what they've got. And I think Boeing and Lockheed Martin, their parent companies, parent, not parrot companies, um, are also quite pleased with that. So, um, yeah, great, great question. Um, and, and I do plan to interview Tori Bruno, the CEO, very soon. And I will I'll ask him all about that. I'm sure he's got his reasons and I've, I've kind of heard some of those, but I would love to hear it more from his mouth and I'll, I'll, and I'll make sure we really get, get down to the root of it. So, um, okay. So, uh, Shane, okay. What was that little thing that comes off the edge of the vacuum nozzle? Yes. Uh, I, I hope that we answered that already. Uh, I answered it right after, uh, Seco and, and booster landing. So hopefully you caught that Shane. Uh, it's a great question. I always forget to talk about it, that the cork ring stiffener, on the outside, but great, great question, Jane. Thank you. Um, IRA Eek, yeah, thank you very much. Trevor, how you doing? Now that Mark One has popped, when do you think SpaceX is going to be able to do their 20 kilometer hop? Keep up the killer work. Everyone needs to go to patreon.com slash everyday astronaut and join. Well, thank you, Trevor. Trevor uh, is in our Discord and uh, an active community member, including helping out with the pre-launch previews. So thank you, Trevor. You don't have to tip me. You're, you're helping with the <laughs> website. Thank you, Trevor. Um, but yeah, uh, my guess is we're starting to see parts from Mark III and, and the new welding techniques and the new sheet metal literally roll out and begin to be fabricated right now at the Cape. Um, based on how long it took SpaceX to build um, Mark, let's see, Mark I, I was there in March and they had it out on the pad um, nine months later. I, honestly... I think they'll go faster this time because they also had to finish up Starhopper in the meantime. But I would not, I would be shocked if it's within three months. I would guess more like midsummer, to be honest. Like total, I know, I know, you're probably going to hear other things about it going a lot faster. But to actually get all of the systems checked out, um, build an entire new fuselage, make sure all those canards, finny, flappy, wingy things are totally ready to go and fuel it up and everything you know don't forget it was about this time last year that starhopper was starting to get built and it didn't really do that full flight until what was that august um and it was a much simpler system right so i'm gonna go ahead and place my bets that it will be um midsummer pacific one second stage is currently over Africa and in about 20 seconds or yeah 20 seconds 20 15 seconds we'll have payload deployment There we go. Don't forget these are spring loaded so they don't use pyrotechnics. So they do not add to space debris. The second stage later gets kicked into a... There on your screen you see the deployment of JCSAT-18 Pacific one I always love watching as the satellite floats away from Ooh. second stage out into space. Again, this was geostationary transfer orbit. So with that confirmation of deployment, we will bring our webcast to a close. Thanks for tuning in uh, for our liftoff from Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, followed by a successful stage one drone ship landing, and as you just saw, successful satellite deployment. Sweet. Thank you to our customer, Sky Perfect JSAT, and to Pacific for entrusting us with today's mission. We also want to give a big thanks to the Air Force's 45th Space Wing for providing range safety and to the Federal Aviation Administration for licensing today's launch. Marcus. Now, of course, we also want to thank all of you, our viewers, for tuning in to today's launch. Please follow our website and social media platforms for updates on our next missions and milestones. 
And until the next time, we hope you have a wonderful rest of your evening. Okay, well, while we have this pulled up, let's go ahead and check out SpaceX's Twitter feed here and see if we got updates on the fairing. Okay. Dun, 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 dun. No updates on the fairing yet, but we will keep this up here and I will just kind of shrink it down and we'll keep answering you guys' questions, but we'll, um, let me know guys, if a, if a tweet comes out, I'll try not to miss it. Um, yeah, let me know. Okay. So let's go back to you guys' questions. Um, congrats again, to SpaceX. <laughs> that was absolutely flawless. Just nuts. Making it look too easy. If you catch, if they catch both fairing halves, um, that's something pretty crazy. Okay. Um, so yeah, my guess, sorry for Mark one would be uh, mid, mid twenty twenty. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, Odani, why don't they just use a helicopter for fairing recovery? Um, you need to remember. Um, uh, so I, I should definitely mention that I have a podcast that I do every single week. Um, you can listen to it right now. It's called Our Ludicrous Future. We also have it here on YouTube, Our Ludicrous Future. It's me and two other YouTubers. Um, we talk about future stuff. So I'm the space guy. Uh, ben Solens from Teslanomics talks mostly EVs. And Joe Scott from Answers with Joe mostly just talks about whatever he wants to talk about, but oftentimes just kind of um, futurism stuff and you know battery technology and things like that. So... Um, yeah, but this is a question that we've answered a, f a few times and it's a really good question because it seems like, you know, we're seeing rocket lab try to recover, uh, their, their boosters using a helicopter. So why aren't they trying to use helicopters for the fairings? And the thing you need to remember those fairings, um, let me click on this picture while I have it pulled up actually, uh, Ignition. this fairing right here is, can fit a school bus inside it. It's freaking huge. That's not to say it's not too that it's too heavy for a helicopter a helicopter could probably pick it up fairly easily but if you're talking about having um people on board um a helicopter and then having it um try to swoop it out of the sky right the problem with that is it's a huge lightweight aerodynamic feature that would be very very hard to control you know it's going to get tossed and turned around a lot in the, in the rotor wash and other things like that. It'd probably be very dangerous to try to catch a fairing, something of that size with that big of aerodynamic property uh, with a helicopter. It, it probably could physically grab onto it, but maintaining control might be too dicey and not worth it. And, and quite frankly, it's not, it's falling pretty slow and pretty well controlled with the steerable parachutes and operating a large boat like that. I don't know if it's cheaper, but it probably is. Those boats are probably pretty expensive. They probably run a lot of gas, but operating a helicopter of that magnitude is very, very expensive. If you haven't ever looked into helicopter rentals, yeah, they get expensive. So um, great question though, um, Odani. And again, another shout out for our ludicrous future. Good luck spelling it. I always have to spell it Ludi Kraus in order to get, <laughs> in order to figure it out every single time. Um, Barlog 951. Do I think SLS will live longer than 2025? Oof, put me on the spot for SLS. Let me tell you this. I, I think earlier this year, I would have said absolutely not. Earlier this year, I would have said there's no way SLS will fly more than twice. That would have been my total bet. Um, I think I have a standing bet that I actually could picture all 16 RS-25 engines that are to be used that are leftover space shuttle engines being used on SLS. So that'd put it at four flights. Um, I stand by that. I actually can see if we really do the Artemis Pro, uh, not if we do, I <laughs> NASA's going for it. Um, Artemis seems to be well underway. And um, I could I could very well see, I really hope there's more than two crewed missions, um, which would, easily be 2025. I, I I don't think we're going to see Artemis 3, which will be the first one to land um, humans back on the moon. They're claiming 2024. If that happens, that would be a miracle. Um, I think the third flight will be 2025. And I think we'll see, hopefully, several others. I, I really hope we can see several others. I don't want to go to the moon, one or two missions, and have it just be like, oh, that's it, until someone else figures it out. And administrations change and all that stuff. I really, really want this to be permanent. Personally, I 
in my personal opinion, I don't think a $30 billion program that has yet to fly once um, at a cost of around $2 billion per flight, I don't think that's the way to go back to the moon to stay, as um, as NASA admin Jim Bryanstein says so often. And I, I love Jim. He's been doing a phenomenal job as an administrator. Um, but, you know, he continually quotes, we're going back to the moon to stay. And he's doing a lot of things to put commercial providers um, in line with that mission. But the problem is, if your ride for those missions is $2 billion, plus the $30 billion or whatever that's been invested in the program so far, it's not sustainable. Not at all sustainable. Um, that's, not, that's the way you get back there. That's the way you get back to the moon, period. It's not the way you get back there to stay. So um, in that case, I think we're still, we'll still see four four plus flights of SLS. Um, that unless the administration changes massively, has a big shift and say something like Starship. What if, here's something, what if Starship beats it? An uncrewed version of Starship lands on the moon on the South Pole and um, then comes back and, and lands and SpaceX is like, hey, we'll sell you seats for X amount of money. I think Congress would speak up pretty quickly. So, um, but it might be a while. Honestly, it might be longer than you think before SpaceX is able to land Starship on the surface of Mars. There's a lot of things that need to be studied. Um, in fuel reorbiting of cryogenic, pr large quantities of cryogenic fuels like that. Um, not to mention landing that large of a vehicle needs to be studied for plume interactions with the Mars with the lunar surface. There's a lot of stuff that needs to be studied. I I think the current uh, NASA administration, the Artemis program, will put humans on the moon before Starship could, um, even in best case scenario, because it is, it's pretty, pretty far along and people need to remember that. Yeah. Great question though. You're putting me on the spot, but I, I, I do have to say one more time. I, I, I actually am really excited about the Artemis program. I'm really excited to get 4k footage of humans, uh, hopping around on the moon. That'll be incredible. I want that so bad. So, um, yeah. Do I think that's sustainable though? No. Okay. Let's keep going. Um, cause I'm sure I just have the, <laughs> the, the, everyone going nuts right now. Okay. Um, the Pikachu, the, the Pichu squad, not Pikachu squad, the Pichu squad. Elon was at the game awards in the public. Yes, he was. Yes, he was. Um, thanks for the, the tip. Um, Henning, thank you for the pair. <laughs> that says cool. <laughs> Um, B3 or Barnard, Bernard, Bernard, uh, can you do a Starship super heavy sim and realism overhaul on KSP? I probably could. Um, I, I, and I might, I might do it soon. I've been meaning to really do some more realism overhaul stuff. Um, I tried, I need to get like the robotics expansion or something for, for realism overhaul. I was playing around with it the other day and I'm missing a lot of things that would be really, really nice to have for realism overhaul, but, um, we will see. Um, that sounds like fun though. I've done a few things like that, but not that exactly. Um, uh, -huh. um, cold cuts. I'll, I'll get to that in a second in our discord. I'll, I'll get to that. Um, but I, I have a, a, quite a few more to get through here. Uh, dash riptide. Well, when you did the last video, did you take into account, um, take into account of the all up test flights, the two F1 engines that failed in the test? No, there haven't been any F1, oh, in the actual test flight. Are you talking about Saturn V, the, the Apollo 6 mission? Because that was a J2. Everyone thinks that an F1 failed on a Saturn V flight. It never did, unless you can find it. It's never failed, including the, the first Saturn V flight, which I believe was actually Apollo 4. Um, the first all-up test uncrewed was Apollo 6, I believe. Um, but yeah, unless you can find a source on that, but let me, let me just go ahead and Apollo six, boom. Brr. Okay. Final blah, blah, blah. Okay. Let's check this out. So the first all up test flight. Okay. Is, um, da -da 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 -da. The final uncrewed, that, I guess that was, this is the last one, but this one had pogo oscillations on J2 engines, rupturing lines. Um, flight controls uh, elected to repeat the flight profile of Apollo 4, which is, this is the first all up. Okay, this had... Um, okay. 
Where is it? J2. I'm just going to type in J2. We're going to find that. Um, hmm. I'm, okay. Do, 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 do. Is there more for that? Just one match on F1. Um, unless you can show me somewhere. I mean, obviously, Wikipedia isn't the know-all, end-all for anything. But um, no. I do not believe there's ever been a failed F1 in flight. Everyone thinks there was. Everyone thinks an F1 failed. I did, too. And we really... This was when we were working on the Raptor video. I went through in our Discord. We spent way too much time going over this. And it, we came to the conclusion that no, an F1 never failed in flight. So um, someone says F1 shut down due to crossed wiring. I don't think so. I don't think so. I think a J2 shut down from crossed wiring. I, I've i never seen anything about an F1 engine shutting down. Um Let's see. Tracking SpaceX ships. Um, okay, wait. I'm going to bring this back up in case we're missing something, but I don't think we are. Uh, let's see. What am I doing here? Boop, de boop. Okay. Let's keep answering questions, though. Um, but dash, dash Riptide, let me know. I'll try to keep uh, a close eye on it, but I do not think there's um, anything other than J2s that ever failed in flight on a Saturn V. Jack, will SpaceX launch Landsat 9? I don't know. I don't know anything about Landsat 9, unfortunately. Um, let's just look it up. Landsat 9. It is flying on an Atlas V. There we go, rocket, Atlas V. Sometimes, just letting you know, um, oftentimes when people ask me questions, that's what I do. I take your question and I Google it <laughs> and that'll typically tell me the answer. Um, I'm not, I'm, thank you. Uh, I appreciate uh, your contribution, Jack, but um, just letting you know for a general rule of thumb, it's pretty easy to find answers these days with our friend Google. So thank you, Jack. That will be an Atlas V. That'll be a ULA launch. Um, Andrew, shout out to Chase Grammar School in England, please. Oh, a, a grammar school? So you can learn English goodest, huh? Good for you guys. Uh, hi, Chase Grammar School in England. Thanks for watching. Do betterest at English than I can because I'm not good at it. <laughs> Thanks, Andrew. Uh, turn racing. Do you think the new Glenn rocket will be a success? Absolutely. I have zero doubts that Blue Origin will make New Glenn very successful. And I don't know necessarily if the first launch of New Glenn will be a success. I'm not going to claim that. But as an overall, the question is, will New Glenn rocket be a success? Absolutely. Um, they People think, they constantly say, oh, I don't, oh, boo-hoo, Blue Origin. They haven't ever put anything into orbit, blah, blah, blah. They act like Blue Origin is having to come up with everything themselves. Like they're starting from complete scratch, like Soviet versus, you know, United States or that era of, of stuff there. Most of the people that work at Blue Origin worked on previous programs um, and have the knowledge base that is the United States government and NASA. Ooh, no, that got me excited 12 minutes ago. Okay. Um, it's not like orbit is this thing that one, you have to achieve it from scratch every time. Yes, it's a new vehicle. Yes, it's very hard. I'm not going to say getting to orbit's easy, but people act like this multi-billion dollar company that's developing one of the most advanced engines in the world um, is, that they just will never figure out how to get into orbit. Um, and I'm not saying that you're saying that, but people people have that attitude. They'll be like, let me know when they reach orbit. They'll never get to orbit. Like, yes, they will. Of course they will. They have <laughs> Jeff Bezos funding the company. They're not going anywhere. Uh, say what you will about, about their funding sources. Um, and it's whatever, spare me those thoughts. I don't care about that. The point is the company is clearly set up to fly. I mean, they have several large facilities now besides, you know, if we look into, they have the facility in, in, in Florida, they have the facility in Alabama building the engines. They have the headquarters out in Washington. That's huge. I've been there. They have the massive launch pad for New Glenn. They're not, they're not bluffing. This is going to fly and it's going to be, remember this thing is going to be huge. It's almost super heavy size. It's almost Saturn V sized. It's freaking huge. So um, yes, the, that rocket will be a success. How long it'll last before um, 
the beast that is uh, Blue Origin ramps it up to be a direct competitor to Starship? I don't know. I, I could see New Glenn only having a, a short lifespan because they're going to be very, very, very aggressive. That's my opinion. Um, that's my opinion. D cool. Um, crazy to think Starlink will make these companies obsolete in the near future with their low latency, affordable internet around the world. That is a consideration. Um, it's definitely going to be game changing when you have that much data available with that low of latency <laughs> anywhere around the world. It'll be harder and harder for those geostationary satellites to, uh, to be competitive. That's very much true. Um, oh, I forgot to say turn, thanks turn racing and thanks D cool. Um, Philip Emanuel, field reporter, it's time to expand your team and brand. Um, I don't quite know what that means, but okay. <laughs> Thanks, Philip. Um, sorry, I don't quite get, know the context on that, but thank you. Um, Efren Arias, does SpaceX have a plan for protecting the crew from radiation for the long Mars ride? I'm sure they're working on it because that is definitely a variable that has to be considered. Um, there's been talks about, I think Elon once even said, if they just face the engines towards the sun, um, that that distance and the amount of fuel and the fuel tanks and everything will protect from radiation shielding from the sun. Um, so that's good. And just that additional amount of even things like, you know, you already have a pretty thick heat shield that some of that might be um, absorbent to radiation or reflective of radiation, things like that. Um, yeah, I'm, I don't know. That's one of those things that, yes, there's more radiation in deep space compared to, say, low Earth orbit. But for the first, I don't know, explorational missions to Mars, I think that's just a risk that people are going to have to take where it's honestly the, the actual radiation output isn't that much worse as far as um, cancer concerns as smoking um, fairly regularly. And plenty of people do that and take that risk without the reward of being the first people on Mars. So I don't think it's going to be... Um, Anything quite like that. Um, but I'm sure they do. I'm sure they're considering it. I don't know if they actually have a solid plan. I haven't actually heard anything. Good question, Efren. Thank you. Come, Quat Lord. How are you? Tim, can you tune in to Mission Control Audio? Oh, SpaceX. Okay. This is something I'm, I'm going to definitely be listening to my Discord channel. We're going to do some internal voting. I, I'm going to do a tweet poll. Should I be re-hosting the hosted live cast or should I be hosting and doing my own with just the launch audio? Um, I want to know your guys' opinion, so be sure to look for that tweet. If you're not following me on Twitter, just search Everyday Astronaut. Even though my user handle is Erday Astronaut because Everyday doesn't fit. I hate it. I'm so sad. But um, yeah, if, if please uh, find, find me on Twitter. Get ready for that poll. I want your opinion on whether, and I'll probably do a YouTube poll as well. When I do a live stream, should I have their launch audio um, or should I just have no audio and just host it myself? Um, my, my deliberation here is I like to hear what they're talking about too because sometimes you learn these little facts on air, but I feel a little funny just sitting here listening um, for 10 minutes or whatever and then um, you know trying to not interrupt them all the time as people complain that I do. Or would you rather me just do this the whole time, do my own rundowns, do my own lead ups and my own explanations to everything? Um, let me know. Let me know, guys. Great question, Kumquat Lord. Night Fox. Um, oh, this is now replaying for some reason. My bild. I'm going to turn that down just in case something happens like that again. Um, Night Fox, as always, thank you for the great live stream. Um, still would, would rather hear, uh, you talk, then SpaceX can always go back and watch later. What do you think about the issues with Starship Mark III rings? I haven't actually even heard of any issues about Star Starship Mark III rings. Um, if, if it's something that's going on right now, like on, on Reddit and NASA Spaceflight and stuff, people are... Here's the thing. And trust me, I've been there, done that. People are obsessed over every tiny thing going on right now with Starship. And I get it. It's it's genuinely unbelievably exciting. Like the fact that we get to be in here during this exciting time of SpaceX is awesome. Like we get to see stuff that should normally be behind closed doors and and every other instance ever is literally behind closed doors. Um, this is not normal for us to see teething pains of and, and evolution like this. It's not normal from the manufacturing perspective. It's also, oh, they missed. Oh, they didn't catch fairings. Oh, well, oh, well, here we go. They'll fish them out of the water, I'm sure. Um, they did that and reused on that last Starlink mission. They reused 
fairings that were fished out of the water. So not a big deal. Um, I'm sure they'll, they'll figure it out though. I'm sure it'll end up being another Starlink mission. That's awesome. Okay. Well, we have our answer. There you go. You heard it here. Not first, but you heard it here. <laughs> um, but okay. So back to the whole rant on, on watching Starship be built. Not only is it, not only is it unusual to see this type of evolution, rapid, quick evolution of prototyping, um, it's not really been done. I think the Soviet Union was similar on their rapid iteration of prototyping of rockets on the early, in the early days where they just built something, tested it, let it break, see what happened, blah, 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 blah. I think that's unusual, but it's also extremely unusual to have the public eye being able to peer in. So um, Mark Three Rings, if there's issues with them right now, I'm sure they'll figure it out, period. I mean... It's not rocket science, <laughs> Wait. but it is. Um, yeah, I think we're just, people love to make um, big deals out of tiny little teething pains that might be headaches for like a little bit of time, but that's kind of why I gave up doing, trying to do weekly space news is it felt like I was just constantly covering these little things that in three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, six weeks, weeks doesn't matter anymore at all. Um, and it's hard. It's, it's a really hard grind. I People that cover it every week, um, like tomorrow and like Kevin space eccentric, it's hard to keep up with it all because there's, it's like head spinning. But the problem is a lot of it in, especially in like two or three months just really is totally, totally thrown away, like literally thrown away and, and on the wayside. So, um, anything, any talks of issues with starship Mark three rings will be fixed and it will not be a big deal and not going to be any kind of game changing, um, thing. That's my opinion. Best buddy, uh, Manka, where did that go? Sorry. Um, it looks like the first stage did a, a bit of a hop on the landing. Can you take a look at it? We sure can. Um, it's always fun to go back and do a little instant replay action. Let's see what we got here. Give me a second. Oh, is that it? It did kind of look like that. I, I agree with you. Okay, that was the landing burn. Sorry, I'll get it pulled up here in a second. Okay. Pew. Okay, so here we go. We're going to be pulling up on the landing room here real quick. We'll take a little look at this, see what we come up with. Okay, so we're seeing it light up, get bright. And... Yeah, it did appear to have a later cutoff than usual. It sure did appear to have a later cutoff than usual. Kind of fun to... This is the same type of thing we were just talking about, though, <laughs> like micro analyzing something like this. Okay, half speed. Ding, 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 ding. Normally the engine's pretty well cut out by then. I think. Maybe it's not a big deal because it, maybe the camera shook. It's really hard to tell. Our only frame of reference here, guys, is um, is the the bright light itself. And let's look for something else down on the deck of the drone ship. See if it moves up and down. It does not appear to. Ah, oh, yeah, maybe this stayed on a little longer. It it does appear to it does appear to rise a little bit, but I'm not saying it did. Um, yeah, maybe it's a learning moment. Maybe it's another one of those times where we're gonna look back and be like, oh, they learned something there, <laughs> and that'll make Starship safer and things like that. Um, fun to go look at. Uh, yeah, thanks for thanks for the tip and thanks for the question, best buddy Manka Manka, uh, Snarfer X. Was there a spike in orders when Elon wore your shirt? Yes, there was. That's another reason why we had to just full don't blown do a, a cutoff right now. Um, yeah, there was a pretty massive spike, very overwhelming to my poor team, who was just starting to finally catch up from all the Black Friday orders. Again, very small team, very hands-on. Um, it's mostly just one guy, but then he has a, a team of... They, they run multiple shops to do it. It's a screen printing shop, and it's my friend that grew up here with me in Cedar Falls. Um, and we were in hardcore bands and stuff and always part of the scene. Awesome guy. Hi, Andrew. Um, and, uh, yeah, so it's, you know, he runs a shop down in Long Beach, California, and he started taking over my merch about last year and he's had to expand his team to keep up with just his growing business. But, um, they got very, very overwhelmed, <laughs> uh, between Black Friday and when Elon tweeted about it. Yeah, pretty nuts. Um, 
Thank you, Snarfer X. Richard Stubbs. Tim, what is the shortest turnaround for a booster launches so far? Also, what is the distance between the three boats um, uh, out for recovery right now? So um, these are great questions. I'll see if Discord can get on that. Can anyone find me the locations? Actually, I bet you know we can do um, um, of ships. We can go to SpaceX Fleet. Let me just pull this up here. SpaceXFleet.com. And we'll see if they actually show the live positions of everything right now. I forget if they do or not. I think you might have to have the, um, let's see. Pew, 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 pew. Oh, I'll pull this up so you can see what I'm surfing on. This is spacexfleet.com. Um, I don't remember if they actually have a latest updates. Um, do, 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 do. Um, so ah, let's see if they actually show the, yeah, they don't have a live update right now of where they're actually at, but the, the fairing ships would be relatively close to each other, like probably within a couple kilometers, you know, don't forget the fairings do separate and they have plenty of time with little to no friction, um, as they separate, um, to, to gain some distance apart from each other. Um, and actually, I think they actually split top and bottom. So one will catch more wind um, or the airstream quicker and they can steer away from each other or whatever. So um, there we go. Um, Miss Gotree is, thank you. I'm gonna pull this up here quick for you guys. Thank you, Mike. Okay, so um, this is just a little bit ago. I'm um, live tracking. Oh, there we go, SpaceX fleet updates. Um, yeah, so. 12 knots, blah, blah, blah. I'm trying to figure out how far they actually are. Um, position. Um, oh, that's so cool. I don't remember seeing a video of this. That's so cool. I love that. For some reason, I thought it was a picture we were looking at earlier. Yeah. I don't remember. But anyway, um, these are quite a bit further downrange than the uh, than the booster recovery is because fairing separation happens afterwards. Um, but I okay, there we go. Fairing recovery zone right there, and LZ per perfect right here. Thank you, SpaceX fleet updates. Um, here you go. Here's our answer: Mi the fairing recovery team right here, and the booster landing down here on the bottom. Now you know. There you go. Great question. And there's your answer. <laughs> um, oh, what shortest turnaround time for boosters is what? Two months? Um, I forget. It's it's about two months. Oop, do, 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 do. Cool. Thanks, Loopy and Mike and everyone in Discord. Uh, I should mention if you, if you want to be part of our Discord channel, which is amazing, they're <laughs> where I pretty much live on Discord and everyone helps way too much. Um, Patreon patreon.com slash everyday astronaut it is a patreon exclusive thing because we have the best community and it's very high quality and i'm extremely thankful for everyone so um yeah consider becoming a patreon member if you want to join our discord our subreddit and gain access to some exclusive live streams especially kerbal these days <laughs> so 71 days is the turnaround time thank you brandon k boom see just over two months um great questions richard jason um is Kissimmee a good place to see the launch Friday? Um, Kissimmee might be a little, let me pull this up to you. We're just gonna keep answering people's questions. Okay. Let's see here. Um, oh yeah, Kissimmee is like basically Orlando. In my opinion, Kissimmee would be a little too far away. It's worth trying to get in a little closer, especially because you're in line. Um, you're in more in line with a rocket too. It's more fun to go somewhere north or south, especially north. Uh, Friday's launch will be a north inclination. So if you're somewhere like Daytona Beach, stuff like that, um, the rocket will go northeast out of the, the Cape. So it'll actually be really fun to see it um, from up north. So. Um, Kissimmee might not be that great of a place. If you can afford to get closer or have time to do it, I would consider doing that. Um, yeah, that's my opinion. 
Um, don't forget, I do have a video about where to watch rocket launches from. So if you want to look that up, there you go. Um, whatever it's called, everydayastronaut.com, or just search like where to watch rockets in Florida and you'll see it. Okay. Um, let's see. Patrick um, Kiss, Kissimmee. Sorry, Kissimmee. I'm learning. I don't know. I don't, I've never, never asked me to pronounce things. <laughs> Patrick, thanks for the membership. Marcus, uh, what happens to the second stage after they release the payload and how long does it, is it there um, after usually staying in space? So lots of times with geostationary orbits like that, they'll kick it out into what's called a graveyard orbit. And they'll literally just like let it be space junk and be way out though. Like we're talking where you would never run into it and it's still a tracked object. Um, most other missions, they deorbit the second stage and intentionally have it crash and burn, um, in the Indian ocean, but, um, and there's even an exclusion zone there as well too. And a lot of companies are taking great considerations and precautions to, um, great considerations and precautions to really make sure that we're not doing, having residual space debris that are, you know, on common inclinations and common orbits. Um, SpaceX, for instance, they use all, they don't use any kind of, um, explosive deployment of anything. Everything's um, pneumatic or spring-loaded, like the payload fairing. The payload deployer is basically a giant spring with some clamps, and they just open it up and let it go. Um, so no poppity pop explosive things. Good question. And yeah, but I'm, I'm going to be working on that. That's actually one of the things I'm talking about in the video that I'm working on right now that I'm almost unscripting. Uh, about the environmental impact of rockets. So it's going to include pollution. So basically how much do rockets pollute? And we're going to cover uh, air pollution, water pollution, and space pollution. So stay tuned. Uh, Parker Russell, can you confirm thick earth? Yes, I can. Confirmed. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Parker. Scott, uh, can you give us an update on the SLS project? Um, Honestly, yes. I, I would talk about it a decent amount again on Our Ludicrous Future, the podcast. And um, for the most part, it's it's kind of getting back on track, it feels like. It feels like, it honestly felt like Boeing was stalled for like three or four years. Um, and it was kind of not fun to see that happen. But um, yeah, I right now, SLS is looking to fly in 2021. I believe they'll be doing their green run, run here in 2020 and flying in 2021. Still slower than I, I wish. I really do wish um, it'd fly sooner than that. But um, yeah, that's kind of where it's at. They just installed all four RS-25 engines down in Michoud in, um, where is that? Technically that's Louisiana, right? Or is it Alabama? It's like right on the border. Um, but yeah, so it, it's really getting there. Um, yeah, yeah, it, it, it's coming together. Um, Britton Bowen, uh, if you got asked to join Dear Moon, would you? Even if it was early startup launch going against your board video. Britton, I can say no right now. I can be like, no way, right? But if I actually got asked by Hisaka Meizawa to be on that flight, I don't know. I don't know if I could say no. It'd be, ins I mean, it'd be the trip, clearly the trip of a lifetime. Or <laughs> literally the trip of... <laughs> Literally the trip of a lifetime, um, depending on how it goes. So I don't, I don't know. I can easily say no while sitting here in Iowa, and I, it is easy to say no because that would never happen. But you know, if you really sit back and imagine, what would it be like if he asked you? Would you still say no despite reservations of safety? I don't know. I can't answer that. Um, thanks for the thanks for the question though. Um, yeah. Right now, good evening, Tim. How are you right now? Um, uh, will you go see the first electron launch in the United States? Also, just got done listening to your latest video while at work. Awesome. Just enjoy your documentary uh, style videos. Thank you so much right now. Um, I do, pro I probably will see electron. For sure in 2020, I'll see electron. I really want to see it in New Zealand. Um, I'm talking with Rocket Lab about trying to, you know, see one of the first ones with fairing or with us uh, booster recovery and, and seeing if I can, you know, document that or something. I think that'd be awesome. Um, and that would be most likely in New Zealand. So I, uh, I'll definitely see an electron this year, whether or not it's in the United States or New Zealand first, we'll see maybe both, maybe both. It will be a rocket lab type of year. Thank you so much for now. Um, new, new Zeagle. Uh, do I have any idea how Starship solar panels will look and function since there've been many design changes since we've seen them? 
Um, New Zealand, well, that's been one of those things that I don't think they're ready to solve that yet. You know, they're kind of going in order and the first bit of business and the second bit of business have been solved or at least pretty well nailed down. And that's the Raptor engine, full flow stage combustion, methane powered Raptor engine. Check. Like that's well underway, pretty far along to make any drastic changes there. Um, and the other thing is stainless steel construction. Um, those are the only two things that are really solved. Anything else beyond that, even the flaps are still very subject to change. Even the, I mean, literally almost everything is still subject to change. And it's it's kind of like solve this first, then solve that, then solve that. Um, I'm sure there probably is a team actually working on solar, um, but I, I don't know where they're at with that. And I don't know if they're ready to be able to implement onto a vehicle that's still changing so much. So it might be one of those things that's very much like on the side. Um, but I'll let you know if we do get any updates on on starship as far as that goes um, i'm really excited for that um claire thank you so much and thomas bolden holy moly um thank you thomas can everyone please also thank thomas for me um that is really genuinely too generous i do not deserve that thank you so much um i'm excited to look forward to putting money like that towards uh, more coverage of more launches and more gear to better my videos at all times, as I always do try. Um, thank you, Thomas. That's very, very, very generous. Thank you. Um, this doesn't exist. Take your super chat money and spend it uh, supporting Tim on Patreon. Well, thank you. This doesn't exist. Again, I really hope that you guys see that I reinvest everything including my time and my life into making content that's um better quality every single time around wait until you see my live stream um abilities i have some new gear that will make covering launches even better and i'll be cranking out videos faster and faster and i believe i'll be hiring someone here full time to join the team um in early 2020 so thank you that just means that there'll be more content from me and i'll be more organized and maybe i'll have some sanity <laughs> So thank you guys. Seriously. Seriously. Thank you. Um, Alex Hood, early advanced, um, early advanced alien civilization is either very uh, patriarchal or wiped out, wiped out female of the species after advanced artificial womb technology. I don't even have any idea what you're talking about. I... I don't know what I just read. I mean, I kind of, I have no idea. Yes. <laughs> um, thank you, Alex. Also, thank you to Message Retracted. Maybe said some naughty words. Um, Zachary Russell, Tim, Everyday Astronaut, Manned Mission or Crewed Mission. Um, I really, I've said this over and over. I don't really want to go to space anytime soon. Maybe, again, once it's, like, more and more routine. I, I, I can see myself doing something like Blue Origins New uh, New Shepard because it's so a quick little ride, has a ton of backups, ton of safety considerations, nice and simple, not a big deal. Um, but I, ugh, I don't know. And you're, you're talking to a guy, I used to race motorcycles, uh, race, like, drag race cars. I've, you know, used to do all these things on, on, in motorsports that were extremely dangerous, and here I am like, I don't know if I'd go to space. I don't know. Once I got like 30, over 30, I guess my perspective changed or something. And now it's just scary and spooky. But um, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe, maybe after I've done a few more things in life at the age of like 50, I'll consider going to space. I have no idea. I have no idea. Good question though. Thanks, Zachary. Um, Patrick Lyons, do I see, where did that go? Do I see NASA becoming more of a regulatory org uh, that foregoes running its own vehicles and simply oversees private companies, um, similar to the NTSB? I, I see, okay, so here's the thing that people forget about NASA is how much research they, they do on advanced things in science. I can, we still need the research. We still need the, the advanced science. We still need all of that. The one thing that I can see shifting and probably in the 2020s is I can see it being frowned upon publicly and even by the administration for NASA to engineer rockets and build rockets. I think SLS will be the last rocket NASA ever builds, quite easily the last rocket NASA ever builds. Um, I think that'll be the biggest change. I don't see them going full-blown um, like regulatory, um, more like a regulatory organization. I see them needing to continue to do the science, 
the organization, like as far as like overseeing a lot of things. Um, there's just so much research that NASA does that, that is so behind the scenes that we, we often forget about it. Um, if, if NASA was able to redirect some of the money that goes into SLS um, and use it more into advanced research, I think we'd have nuclear propulsion back on the table. I think we'd have more advanced ion drives. I think we'd have um, quicker, uh, right now, like we're, they're working on supersonic, uh, on a quiet supersonic project um, that I think just got greenlit to actually do some of its first, um, to actually be built and test out supersonic, um, high-speed supersonic stuff. Um, yeah, so that's... Um, that's a good question. I, I've done a video about NASA versus SpaceX where I, I really, there's two of them. This is, this is one of the reasons why I started just doing longer videos because it's a two part video that lines up how important NASA is. And then we compare NASA's rockets versus SpaceX rockets. Of course the, and the part two starts off by saying you have to watch part one that has like 200,000 views and part two has like 400,000 views, of course. So, um, but watch part one of that. It really does go into deep about kind of the organization and how I still think NASA is extremely important and vital going forward. Um, but I do see a little shift in some of that stuff. Um, and and Ziegel, um, thanks again, Patrick. And Ziegel, hey, Tim, I was just wondering what changes have happened to Starship solar panels. Wait, did I already read that? Did it come in twice? Yes, it did. Um, hopefully you got that answer there, um, and Ziegel. But thank you for the double, double super chat. Thank you. Um, Stephen Hockey, do you think Elon will ever be allowed to go to space due to insurance? And his importance to the company, um, risky behavior clauses. I think he could eventually. Um, I, I definitely think eventually he'd be able to, to go to space. Um, he might have to dissolve some more responsibilities at some of, uh, of Tesla and, and SpaceX to be able to do so. Um, and or have a more and more and more proven flight record and reliability where it's not considered as high of risk. But I can see it someday. Before I think he will go to space before he leaves this earth. In another way. Um, yeah, that's my guess. Thanks. I'm um, Stephen, uh, Steve Hockey. Frank, you're welcome. Thank you. Uh, Randy, um, do you think we will see the Orion capsule on a new Glenn? Potentially, actually. Um, new Glenn would be able to get it into low Earth orbit, and then it would still take another launch or two to be able to get it out to anywhere deep space. Um, and or at least have like I think it would take a whole nother new Glenn to get a kick stage up there in order to you know some kind of vehicle capable of giving it a TLI um, translunar injection to be able to get it out to the moon would take another like kick stage. Um, it would it would require some extra parts, a lot of extra considerations. But I I, I could actually potentially picture Orion on top of New Glenn if SLS um, has any more big hiccups in its path. Um, enables. You forgot to sub to my channel. How dare you miss things is important. Uh, you just bought a full flow stage combustion shirt. Well, thank you, Enables. Enjoy it. I'm sure you will. They're awesome. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Mark Sweeney, um, I'll answer your poll as well, but I enjoy hearing the tidbits the SpaceX commentators um, sometimes say. I also like to hear what you have to add in between their comments. Um, I also love the after launch Q&A. Well, here's the thing. The after launch Q&A definitely wouldn't go away. Um, I don't know. I have this philosophy that like, if you, it can go both ways. Cause like if people don't want to hear me talk, they can watch the SpaceX streams. It's that easy. People can not click on my videos. I always find it funny when like, why this guy needs to shut up. Like you clicked on my video. What do you, wh what? Like go watch the live, go watch the real one. What are you doing? Um, <laughs> so I, I, I get that people that are watching this right now and are, if you're watching this right now, even in the future, hi, future people, um, that you too are, are choosing to click on this most likely, unless you're being held captive. Um, but in either case, I do think, I don't know, I can see it both ways though. Cause it's like, I also can see that it's fun for me to listen and learn along while commenters happen, but it is awkward to not step on their toes sometimes. I don't know. I don't know. We'll see what the polls say, but thank you for your input, Mark. Jonathan, greetings from Canada. All the talk about um, Starship SLS. Can you talk a bit about how you plan to be at launches with everything, uh, with ever-changing launch dates? So here's the thing, Jonathan. Um, going forward, I have some plans, and I'm going to be telling my Discord about this pretty soon, um, at least the commanders. Um, stay tuned, commanders. But I have some plans about how to cover launches in an even more exciting way uh, in the very near future. So... Get ready for that. That's that's all I'm going to say for now. 
Uh, but the ever-changing launch dates is hard, but the good thing is with increased frequency, um, if I were to travel out to a launch to watch it, it's there's a better and better and better going forward chance that I would actually be able to catch a launch. So that's always exciting. Yeah. All right. So uh, where are we at? Thank you, Jonathan. I'm um, Howard Fairings. Ayo, <laughs> look like I'm going for a swim. Yes, it unfortunately. But again, hopefully it's not a big deal and they can reuse it. So um, thank you, Nicholas. Night Flax again. You're welcome. Um, thanks for covering this with. Thanks for covering this as always. Merry Christmas from Night Fox. Thank you, Night Fox. That's awesome. That means a lot. And thank you for joining me. Seriously, like I, we talk about it in our ludicrous future all the time. The other YouTubers, you know, all of us are full time YouTubers that do this. And the other two guys just always laugh when they say that I have the best fans. And they're right. They are not wrong. I have a very loyal audience and you guys are unbelievable and you cheer me on, uh, especially help make it easier through the negativity on the internet. Uh, it's all because you guys that I'm able to continue going. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So um, as much as I can say thank you and as you say thank you, I can say thank you more. So thank you. <laughs> Ryan Quinn, an, an awesome pair again. I don't get what these pairs are, but I love them. <laughs> Dale Catlett. Uh, Dale Catlett. Um, should space colonization be a matter of national security? It, I think it is uh, a bit of matter of national security, and it is already a, a pretty big consideration. Um, yeah. Um, I don't think things like colonizing the moon. So as far as space colonization, I, I assume you're talking about like colonizing Mars and the moon. I don't think that's a matter of national security because there's very few things that could happen on the surface of the moon That'd be any worse than any that anything like that people could just do in normal space assets. But as far as like just space assets, that's obviously a potential for na national security. But I don't think like being on the moon poses any direct risk to um, the Earth, really, for that matter. Um, good question, though, Dale. AP. Hi, Tim. Thanks for another great stream. My nine-month-old son lives in his future scientist onesie. That's awesome. What motorbikes did I race? Oh, God. Do you want the list? Um, I had, I was always a sport bike guy and I do drag racing. We have a nice drag strip right here, uh, north of town. So, um, let's see. My first bike ever was a 19, 9, 1990 Honda CBR 600. Um, it was technically not the hurricane cause I was 89 only. So it was an F still an F one though. Then I had a 1992 Honda CBR. Then I had a 1995 ZX9. That was the first one that was actually fun to drag race. Um, then I had um, a Z1000, um, an RC51 by Honda, a 2000 RC51. That was a really fun bike. I owned that for a long time. Um, I also owned at one point, and I'd buy a lot of bikes and I'd fix them up too. That was um, a thing that I used to do. I had a ZX10R. I had a, oh God, I still have a Ducati 996. I haven't ever raced that though. It's more, I just have always wanted a Ducati. So I bought it like five years ago and I've barely ridden it. <laughs> I got a good deal on it and it's just so pretty. Um, and I have uh, built a hot rod like CB360. The, mo the ones that I really raced the most by far though was the ZX9 uh, and the, um, I raced the Z1000 a few times. That wasn't very fun. It's too upright. Um, but then I, the ZX10R and the RC51, I raced a lot, uh, a lot of weekends, a lot of fun very scary. <laughs> I don't think I have that in me anymore. Yeah, I do. What am I talking about? I'd still get on one and ring it through the gears, of course. Um, yeah. Th uh, la, la, la. Sorry, that was a total side tangent, but thank you, AP. Uh, Mike D, can you explain the wires and plunger-like devices that disconnect from the second stage? Those are the umbilicals. And the plunger-like devices, I don't exactly know how they all work, but it is some kind of quick disconnect. But don't forget, that has to be sealed up and handling like three or four bar of pressure uh, to fill up the tanks and fill them up hurry too. They, they flow a lot of cryogenic fluids through those ports. And then the wires are literally to have communication lines run to the, to the rockets and to power the rocket with electricity until it goes on an internal power. And then all that needs to pull cleanly from the rocket before it takes off. Um, I'll try to do a video about umbilicals someday I don't know if I'd be able to find a lot of information on newer rockets because it's probably pretty proprietary. So, um, but yeah, um, great question, Mike D. Hopefully that helps explain at least enough to maybe go down your own rabbit hole about learning about uh, quick disconnects and umbilicals. But yeah, that's that's kind of all I know at the at this point, to be honest. Um, so thank you, Mike. Um, oh, the bill. 
Uh, love you, Tim. Is Starship going to send cargo supplies, habitats to Mars before the humans go? Absolutely. Um, SpaceX would not land. I don't think they would plan to land a human on Mars without there being a fully fueled Starship waiting for them when they arrive. That's um, probably almost guaranteed. Um, I think that's very much in part of their plan. I know they plan to send um, some uncrewed Starships a few years before the on the, on the first window two years before they plan to send humans to Mars. So, and I know the, the plan kind of is to make sure that they have everything worked out and have some backups in case, uh, yeah, in case something were to go wrong with their ship, but just have everything all ready to go propellant plants and things like that. Um, the in-situ resource utilization plants up and running and things just pretty much ready to go for people, um, before they get humans to Mars. So good question. Oh, the bill, um, Thanks. Thanks for the, the question. Good Earth. Thank you for the membership. Marcus, I think most space enthusiasts are positive peeps. You are right. For the most part, you're very right. Like, especially, um, it's just, you know, it's the internet. So there's always going to be arguments and things like that. And I think we all need to remember not to take anything like that personally, but also not to, um, not to debate the person, but to debate the topic and, and do it in a respectful way is always something that's kind of hard to do. Um, when it's on the internet and when you're not facing someone face to face. So just please remember what anytime we all can take responsibility for our own actions, but anytime you're making any comment on the internet, please just take that extra second or two to remove pointed words. Like you like, Oh, you didn't even think about that. Did you like, don't infer what someone was thinking or not thinking. Don't say you idiot. It goes like this, like remove those words. And, and when you do, you communicate a lot more clearly and you'll actually get further into a conversation um, and deeper into a topic because you're able to focus on the content of the the message sent via electronics or in person and people spend less time being emotional and having that interaction. So um, we can all do that, take our part to, to make the internet a more positive place and everything a more positive place. Because quite frankly, we're living in really exciting times and I'm just excited to be able to sit here and watch rockets be reused. <laughs> like, are you kidding me? Exciting times. Um, no reason to fight and bicker and be mean to people. So just keep that in mind. Um, thank you, Marcus. Sorry, that was a total tangent. Uh, and come, Quat Lord, we're gonna end this. Please, no more messages. My throat hurts and I need to eat. <laughs> come, Quat Lord. Can you ask Elon if he ever considered using high energy monoprops like Cavia B for abort systems and the such? Now, I know nothing about those, but um, I could look into seeing and find the answer. Um, I tend to not totally ask Elon questions that aren't tangential to something he's already talking about. So if abort systems come up in a tweet that he does, then I'll maybe consider asking if he's ever looked into something like that. So um, I've never actually heard of Cavia B, but um, yeah, it'd be really hard to have a high enough specific impulse and high enough energy out of just a monoprop for to make it for a decent abort option. But I don't really know. And Mike, you snuck in, you, you little sneaky sneaky person there mike thank you so much for the for the tip uh i'm gonna wrap it up here guys one last reminder everydayastronaut.com slash shop again you're probably too late to catch um if you are trying to get this out before christmas unless you live like really close to california or in california you're probably too late to be able to get it there in time um but still uh if you want to support what i do the most fun way is to go to everydayastronaut.com slash shop and getting some of these shirts and again if you work in the aerospace industry um, you can click on the link and it'll send you 25, a code for 25% off. It's an automated process that checks the domain of your work email. So you can't just cheat the system and type in fake at something spacex.com. You have to have access to the email. It's all automated. Um, that's my thank you to you for working in the aerospace industry and encouraging me to do what I do. Um, that truly means the world. And we are, um, and don't forget to check out the, the RUDS section here, guys. Um, we're sold out of a lot of them are selling out now. Uh-oh, better get in there. Um, but this is the rapid unscheduled discounts section. So if you want something at uh, a, at an awesome price, a once in a lifetime price, click in here. We've got sales going on some awesome items. We still have a few Falcon tees. The science tees and hoodies are just about gone. I think some sizes are already gone. And other things are sold out, so I have to clear out that inventory here soon. But there you go. Um, let's see. Um, cold cuts. Cold Cuts in our Discord wants to know if the moon is a required step before Mars. I'm not someone that thinks that, to be honest. Um, they're different. You can test out some systems by landing on the moon, and um, you can test out, but it's not a required step. I don't think that computes in my head. 
Um, but it is an easy place to, to do some shakedown testing. And it's a very easy place to, to kind of learn some, some things, but, um, it's not always a direct correlation between landing on the moon. Therefore means you're ready for Mars. And it doesn't mean you need to land on the moon in order to go to Mars. Yeah. I'm going to wrap it up here. Uh, Patrick also mystery, mischief, misfarings. Hey, <laughs> that's, that's sad and mean kind of, but you're right. Uh, thanks Patrick. So, um, there you go, guys. Um, thank you so much again for everything you guys do. Uh, be sure and check out my video about Starship Abort Systems. I'm really excited to see um, how that video does because it's a question that I got asked about all the time. So hopefully I didn't totally overdo it with way too much information. Hopefully you guys really enjoy the storyline there about um, everything aborts, really. Everything. <laughs> hopefully it answers all your questions and gives you a, a decently shaped perspective on whether or not Starship needs an abort system. So, yeah. Thank you guys so much for everything. That's going to do it for me. I'm Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut, bringing space down to Earth for everyday people. Bye, everybody. We'll see you soon for the OFT-1 mission. Bye.